Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Fultz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana, she's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. should be set in gothic mansions with sinister shadows and serpentine staircases that lead to secret dungeons. But you never think of hearing of such things in a light and airy, pastel-colored Victorian mansion, not in New Roads, Louisiana anyway. But often the reverse is true, and so it is here. In this tiny Creole French country town with its history dating back almost 300 years, visitors can sit and be enlightened at stories of angelic faces peering through the lead glass doors or of the smile of an elderly black woman staring into the back kitchen door. And please, y'all, don't be skeptical. Don't be afraid. These warm and friendly faces from the past are just saying welcome to this magnificently restored bed and breakfast. I'm Chef John Falls. Welcome to the banks of beautiful False River and to a street once called Silk Stocking Row. Come and enjoy Creole Country Inn. This 150-year-old home is gabled with turrets and wide galleries depicting authentic Creole Victorian architecture. Its center hall, soaring ceilings, moldings, and hand-carved details are reminiscent of its earlier days of splendor. Y'all check out this front door. Guests here at Creole Country Inn are pampered in fine linens and wake up wrapped in an ambiance of comfort and cheer. This inlaid bedroom set is exquisite. Just check out the magnificent detail on the matching armoire and coordinating nightstands. These pieces boast charm and elegance. How can one not find peace in this bedroom? Linda's insight into the needs of each guest makes her the most sought after host in this bed and breakfast community. This charming feather bed could not be a more appropriate backdrop for grandmother's oriental linen cabinet. Ah, y'all take a look at this fine piece. The cabinet is filled with heirloom fabrics from Linda's past. The hand-painted details enhance this lacquered masterpiece which subtly tells the story of an Asian village and its people. It's further decorated with birds and flowers. What a unique little linen cabinet. And y'all, check out this room. It's extra special because not only does it contain this 1700s Philadelphia Dutch on why, isn't it gorgeous? But I want you to see what Linda refers to as her family cloth. It's right here on the bed. Ah, there it is. Tatted by her great-grandmother in the late 1870s, this precious heirloom has been used at family marriages and burials. Just take a look at this handwork. You won't see much of that around anymore. And the gardens here, y'all, just magnificent. Yes, those angelic faces cannot help but smile each time guests experience love of life here at the beautiful Creole Country Inn near False River, Louisiana. What a spot. 
Y'all imagine the year 1996 and Linda Lawrence is needing a little time off. There's been an illness in the family, so she gets in her car and she drives about two hours outside of New Orleans to the little town of New Road. She's never been there. She has no reason to be there. And all of a sudden, she's in front of this gorgeous old Victorian home that's just kind of falling apart. And she looks through it, and I guess within an hour, she has signed the purchase agreement, if you can imagine that, and created one of the greatest inns that we possibly can, that we can find in Louisiana, Creole Country Inn. And uh, she's going to tell us a little bit about that, uh, uh, that story a little bit later. Also, uh, her deja vu evenings, where all of the guests kind of sit around the parlor and tell stories about their life. And she tells me that the true stories are always is much, much better than the fiction. So it sounds like a great place. It's a gorgeous place, and the food is magnificent right there on False River. Now, you know, game and fish seems to be the obvious choice uh, for a B&B &B that's uh, on a lake, on, a, on an oxbow lake, a part of the Mississippi River. Uh, and one of the dishes that I'm going to create for you today is a uh, a goose, a pot-roasted goose from uh, the Falls River area. There's a great story about the Cajuns leaving Nova Scotia and arriving in the swamp lands of Louisiana and discovering on that first winter here all of the Canadian geese coming to roost here for the winter months. And imagine they considered it an omen because that's the food that they had lived on for so long in Nova Scotia prior to the exile to Louisiana. So all of a sudden their life was complete here in the swampland. So I'm going to do their, uh, their, their favorite recipe, uh, pot roasted Canadian goose. Take a look at this platter, y'all. This is about a, a five pound goose. And of course in season here, this is a Canadian speckle belly uh, geese also very, very big here. But this is probably the goose of choice for the Christmas table here in Louisiana. And to season it, I'm going to put a little Creole seasoning inside and out. And y'all remember, always over season the inside of a bird, whether it's a duck or a goose or a chicken or a capon, it doesn't really matter because there's a bony structure in here. The skeleton of the goose will keep all of those seasonings from coming through to the meat. So over season the inside. Salt, pepper, and of course, kind of rub that in really, really nice herbs of any kind, basil, thyme, just kind of rub it into the meat. I have to put garlic here, y'all. I have to rub a lot of garlic into that goose. And remember, season inside, out, all around the goose. Put a lot of garlic inside and then a mixture of your favorite vegetables. I like to throw whole onions into that cavity because it's going to steam inside of there and create a fantastic flavor. Celery, carrots, just kind of push all of that down into the center of the goose. Uh, look at this. I've got to show you this elephant toe garlic, y'all. Compare that to the regular garlic. See, this is the hands of a cook. This is the hands of a cook, y'all. Doesn't that look good, huh? <laughs> Just go ahead and put that garlic right down inside. And now you're ready for the uh, roaster. I'm going to use an old Dutch oven here. In fact, come on over uh, to the stove, and I'm going to fire up this Dutch oven with a little bit buttery flavored oil. You want to put uh, a little oil in the bottom because we have to sear the goose. We have to seal in all of those fantastic flavors because remember a goose isn't, a, at least a wild goose, isn't a, a fatty animal. So you want to reserve as much of the flavor as you possibly can, the natural juices. Put a uh, can you hear that sizzle, y'all, huh? That's what it's all about. A good sizzle is what you're looking for to seal that meat. And then you want to kind of rock that goose around a little bit uh, to get the uh, browning effect all over it. Look at here, just kind of keep going around. And you can see how it browns quickly. And this is going to be a braised dish. You're going to slowly cook the goose in a braising liquid, which is either game stock or a beef stock, chicken stock, whatever you like. You could put water and wine in it if you want to. I'm going to use a little bit stock. And go ahead, look how, look how brown that is. Isn't that gorgeous, y'all? And imagine all of those flavors that's still inside the bird. And now I'm going to come back and put some bacon. Bacon right over the top. Remember I said that this wasn't a fatty bird? Well, it's not, so you want to add some nice basting juices uh, to the goose by putting some smoky bacon right on top of it. And then, y'all, all of your other seasonings and flavors. Throw the rest of the carrots, the celery, all those wonderful things. 
Put a little bit onions, more diced onions around the bottom. And then a big bowl full of root vegetables like potatoes and carrots, uh, uh, turnips. I love turnips and goose too. Well, I tell you what, Linda Lawrence is gonna love this goose recipe. I know she's gonna serve it often at Creole Country. And now a little bit stock. I'm gonna put some of that, I'm gonna use beef stock, y'all. Goose is a hearty, hearty uh, bird. So you wanna kinda put a little bit stock, enough to come up about halfway the bird. And then, as I say, this is gonna be a braise. So allow this to come to a rolling boil. Once it comes to a boil, cover it. You can leave it right on top of the stove to pot roast on top of the burner. Or, of course, you can put it in an oven, 400 degrees for about two to three hours. Remember, the age of the goose will determine the tenderness of the bird. You want it nice and tender. And take a look at what this one looks like when it comes out of the oven, y'all, all said and done, roasted, or right out of the pot roast. Isn't that a gorgeous bird, just all really nice and golden brown caramelized, absolutely gorgeous. The Baked Goose False River from Creole Country Inn, one of my favorite dishes that I found over at that great spot on Falls River. Now let's talk about another dish, y'all, a breakfast dish. In fact, this is a waffle. And the waffle is a cornmeal waffle. It's kind of interesting because it has a variety of, uh, of, uh, of different things. Normally you think of bacon powder, flour, eggs, milk. Well, look into this bowl here. I'm starting off with cornmeal, about one and a half cups, some pecans, uh, chopped pecans, a little bit flour. I got about two and a quarter cups of flour here and blend all of your dry ingredients together. A little bit baking powder, about, oh, let's say two tablespoons of baking powder, a half a cup of sugar, kind of blend it in there. And this waffle recipe, y'all, was the recipe of a Miss Young and a Miss Murphy, two Creole cooks that are cared for Linda as a young girl and told us stories about Louisiana and created this a cornmeal waffle for her for breakfast every day and always served it with a cranberry syrup. And I'm gonna make that syrup for you too. Now, a little bit butter, about, oh, let's say about a quarter cup. Eggs, six eggs. Put a lot of eggs in there because we're making a waffle batter. And you wanna kinda now mix the eggs with the dried ingredients to kinda form a batter. We're making a waffle batter here. And then into that, the, uh, the milk, about three cups of milk, y'all. Go ahead and put it in. And make sure you stir this and blend it well to get all of the lumps out of your batter. After all, you don't want lumpy waffles, do you? Hmm? I've had a few of those. They're not as good as the unlumpy waffles, y'all. So just go ahead and stir this around nicely. Use a whisk. Go ahead and put a whisk down in there. And uh, whip it around to blend it all up. And once it's all blended like this, then you have a really nice batter, and it's not too sweet. That's what I like because the uh, syrup will actually sweeten. Now, I have some batter already done, so let's uh, look at my little waffle iron here, and I'm gonna spray a little vegetable coating on the inside, like that, and then put about a cup. You almost need a full cup of waffle mix right down into the waffle maker. Isn't that fantastic, huh? Very easy to do. And close that lid and let it cook for about three minutes or so. That waffle's gonna be perfect. Let me show you quickly how to make the syrup, y'all. I've uh, put a little bit water into my uh, saute pan here, and I'm gonna throw in some, uh, one of those 14 ounce cans of cranberry preserve. It's got the juices in it. It's got the fresh cranberries. And then, of course, I can also add um, some fresh cranberries. Or if you want to, fresh raspberries, blueberries, blackberries. Just go crazy here. In fact, I'm going to throw in some beautiful raspberries because they're in season, and I can blend that around nicely. And y'all, a cup of maple syrup. Can you imagine that great flavor? Maple syrup. I like to use uh, cane syrup in Louisiana, too. It's not quite as light as the uh, maple syrup, but boy, is it fantastic. A really, really nice dish. Now, y'all, you would let this simmer until all of the fruit kind of marries well with the uh, maple syrup and thickens nicely. And uh, I think you have the uh, general idea here. So once it cooks, go ahead and you can even either put it in a little glass pitcher or put it in one of these mason jars. Take a look at mine in the mason jar right here. And I have all of the pulp in the jar. I, 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 I don't think you can... Uh, 
you can just put this on the shelf now, y'all. You have to go ahead and put this in a pressure cooker if you want to save it, but I would put it in the refrigerator and look at that waffle here. Uh, mm, mm, right out the old waffle iron. This is a great recipe that Linda Lawrence and her husband shared with me when I was over at the end. Just fantastic. And just put as much fruit as you would like, and it's going to be one of the most magnificent waffles. And as I mentioned, it's not too sweet. I hate a waffle that's so full of sugar that it tastes like you're almost eating a, a bowl full of syrup. Now, now, let the, uh, the, the cranberry sauce sweeten the waffle. Now, y'all, I was real lucky to be able to go sit out on that gorgeous patio with Linda Lawrence and talk a little bit, not only about her life as an innkeeper, but what brought her to Louisiana all over a nice ice-cold glass of breakfast cheer, y'all. So come on out onto the patio and enjoy the Louisiana breezes off of Falls River with Linda and I. All right, look at the beautiful champagne for a little breakfast cheer here. Linda, this is one of the most refreshing breakfast drinks I think I ever had. Tell me a little bit about the origin of it. I would say that the origin comes from the San Joaquin Valley, where there was an abundance of pears and oranges and a blender. And one day, I was up and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and I threw them all together and threw some champagne in, and we had this. Ah, it's absolutely fantastic. You mentioned the San Joaquin Valley. The San Joaquin Valley is kind of a moonshot away from New Roads, Louisiana. Tell me, how does a girl get from San Joaquin to uh, Falls River? You mustn't forget the moon hangs full in the sky, honey. Wherever there's a light <laughs> and a home to shine on. And I just happened to fulfill my dreams and bring them into my reality in terms of moving, dreaming, moving came, dreaming came, but to take it and turn it around, I moved based on a dream. And if you don't follow your dreams, what do you follow? That's true. It's yeah. absolutely true. You know, I've heard the stories, I've read them, in fact, as I mentioned it just a minute ago, about you being called to this house, and after being here for a short time, you actually saw faces through the leaded glass doors. Tell us about that. Sitting in my hallway, you see that very long table, enjoying Beautiful myself. Beautiful table. Beautiful table, very, very nice quality. However, the quality came from the vision, glancing over out of the peripheral vision that someone was coming to my door, and my daughter announced it. Kimberly said, Mom, someone's at the door. Jim gets up to go greet them. No one's there. Turns around, sits down, says nothing more. Now, that's where the door of a thousand angel faces came from. And it happened many times. And it happens at sunrise when the sun peeks through them. And it happens in the evening when the candlelights dance across them. Now, you told me that you later found out that those doors came from an old mortuary somewhere, right? It did, St. Francisville. And because this was low ground, St. Francisville was high ground, and so the burying took place over there. But can you imagine the dancing faces of little angelic beings that went through there? Oh, I can only imagine over the many, many years that it was a mortuary. 235 years those ages of the glass windows happened to be. Now, you know, that's a pretty special attraction here at the house, but what other attractions do you offer guests? I think that fine food, or you wouldn't be here, and <laughs> good right. company, Fine food, good company, nice rooms, accommodations, but good company. Isn't that what we're here for, a Louisiana experience of good company? Absolutely. And you have a magnificent home on one of the most beautiful lots that I've ever seen. And I've heard that you spoil your guests like no other. What do well, you do? Now, when you arrive, you have to have a, a special little bit of wine, something to supple. And yeah. then you have to move on to a little patage and some fresh cheese that I find usually being made within our region, as well as fresh fruit, and you stop and you sit on a gallery and you just rock a little while. And yeah. then you might want to do something with your spiritual growth, and you might or might not. But if you choose to, there are readings in the metaphysical truth and the spiritual truth and the angelic messengers that come to visit us. Well, Linda, I can't wait to come back to uh, Creole country and, and enjoy a little bit of that uh, special treatment myself. So thanks so much for having us here today. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Well, y'all, there should be no doubt that you have to get out and spend the morning on the patio at Creole Country Inn. What a fantastic place to bring on the day with a glass of breakfast cheer. Let's take a look at it. We begin this dish with about a 15-ounce can of Bartlett pears with the juice, 
a quart of fresh squeezed orange juice, and then about a half a bottle of champagne. Boy, that really kicks off the morning on False River. And the next dish, this could be a side dish, it could be a vegetable, it could be a salad. It's called Fiesta Muck Shoe Salad, y'all. Corn and uh, squash all uh, put together in a salad dressing, triple sec. A little bit tequila, all kind of great things to spice up that dish. Now, y'all, uh, another great girl who came from Falls River, Angel Parlange, a designer, no less, who has a shop on Magazine Street in New Orleans. And uh, she wanted to share with us a little bit about how do you go about decorating a great B&B if you're just trying to get into the business. Come on down to New Orleans and see what she had to say on the subject. Oh, yeah, we're uh, sitting in your shop here on Magazine Street in downtown New Orleans, and I have to wonder, how does a country girl get from the banks of False River in New Roads, Louisiana, to the pages of Vogue magazine, uh, House Beautiful, New York Times? How does that happen? I grew up at Parlange Plantation, and we always had visitors from all over the world, including yourself, I know. <laughs> and that combination with really having a great imagination and growing up in a family with a lot of history created a keen design sense for me and I'm passionate about it and I live it every day and it's rewarding and it's that determination that makes it all happen. You know, uh, I read a, a very interesting piece uh, uh, that, that you wrote. You said that a designer's roots definitely influences their style and that's pretty apparent here. It certainly is apparent with me. My great-great-grandmother had a salon in Paris in the early 1800s and it was from her calling cards that were left there that my first fabric design was inspired from. There were all the names and addresses of the people who visited her and also another design called Madame X was the subject of John Singer Sargent's famous portrait and she uh, shared yeah. that same great-great-grandmother. So whether it's my family roots or Louisiana history or architectural motifs I always look to history. You know often I think of the word designer as uh, a word that invokes visions of uh, opulence, a grand style, a lot of money maybe. Is uh, that always true? It's not always true in my case. I work with a lot of beautiful and fancy fabrics but you can just get one piece really that can take on a whole new aspect to a room. So you don't have to use the whole kit and caboodle really to furnish the room. You can have just one little piece of frame or whatever to make something interesting. What, what does a designer really bring to the table? I think what a designer can bring to a client is an eye that maybe the client doesn't have a trained eye and vision and make just any room or table seem a bit more interesting and maybe that little element of surprise and unexpectedness. How do you personally view a project? If you call into someone's home or office, do you bring all of your own thoughts and that's it or do you kind of marry them with the client? I always like to get their viewpoint because everybody's got a, an opinion and I like to really embellish that with my own work and whether they have a passion for a particular color or style, I can make that happen for them. So, so, so in other words, my kitchen would be full of little, uh, little cooks and spoons, and uh, you, you'd bring some <laughs> of that in, right? I sure would. <laughs> Okay, I'm the owner of a B&B. I've just bought this beautiful Victorian home. It's sitting on uh, about six acres of land, four beautiful oak trees uh, out there. I don't know a thing about color. I don't know a thing about furniture, nothing about artwork. How do I approach a designer and what should I expect from them? I think once you know who you're going to work with or if you like that designer's style, then you can have them really see where you're going to live and what you're going to do with your place. And if you have an old home, you should have some historical references and then perhaps bring in some modern touches to it as well, just to make it more comfortable for your guest. Right, so you just kind of come in and survey the situation and then go ahead and make recommendations uh, based on that. Now, one of the things that I've always uh, loved about your style is your table settings. I mean, you've worked on Oprah's uh, uh, 
projects. You've certainly worked with Martha Stewart. You've been with all of the big ones. And, um, and I love what you do with the table. You know, I would love to be able to put like a uh, veal chop with a nice sauce right on one of these plates for you. Maybe we ought to combine some styles. I would love that. That's the only thing this is missing, I think. <laughs> it needs a veal chop. <laughs> well, good. Angel, thanks so much for sharing all of your uh, thoughts with us today. Well, thank you. And thanks to all of you for stopping by as we continue to visit the bed and breakfasts of the Bayou State and cook up more great taste of Louisiana. Yeah, we have to cook up something to go right here on that plate. I'll be waiting for you. To learn more about A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Folson Company, visit PBS online at the internet address on your screen. Hot beignets and warm boudoirs by Chef John Folson is available for $29.95. This companion book to the series features over 150 recipes. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen. Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Fultz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana. She's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.